Woody Womack joined by Mike Farrell for our second episode, Mike, of our new weekly podcast. How are you doing? Good. Very popular podcast, too. Oh, yeah. Boy, it really moved, really moved the needle. Well, this compared week. to the one that I also do, <laughs> this one's like, this is like a superstar. All right. So let's jump right into the topics. We had a big week in college football. What a fun, what a fun. This was the first Saturday. It really felt like a real season, right? Yeah, there were a lot of good games out there. And, uh, you know, once the Big Ten gets in, then it's going to be really exciting. Uh, Pac-12, I don't know. We'll see. But Big Ten, I'm waiting for that. And it feels like college football because there were guys in the stands, as Dan Mullen laments. But we can get to that in a, in a bit. Yeah, we can talk about that. All right, let's start with Clemson and Miami. This was the game of the day. And uh, as expected by me, uh, Clemson handled them easily. Uh what did you pick on your little pick show? And what did you think of the way that thing played out? I took Clemson to cover. They were a two touchdown favorite. Um, of course, I hedged my bets and said this is either going to be a close game, which I hope for uh, with Clemson winning or a Clemson blowout. Um, but I picked Clemson to cover the spread. They did. They're clearly the better football team. Miami's not ready for prime time yet. Um, you know, this wasn't an embarrassing loss. It was just a, just a good old fashioned beating you know I mean they didn't lose 60 to nothing but it was it was Clemson's from the get-go I mean there's just no stopping them yeah the game was never really in doubt maybe that stupid field goal before halftime I mean what a what a dumb decision that was huh I I got nobody to blame for myself Mike you notice how I imitate everybody and they all sound the same yeah only so you only you only imitate southern people well that's all I got but (laughs) Dabo you know he clearly screwed up. That was a dumb idea. Um, he admitted it, owned it, gave Miami a little bit of uh, momentum, but it didn't matter. I mean, when, when I did the skills breakdown between the two of them last week, you know, it was pretty apparent that Clemson is so much deeper at every position. And I think that showed. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Miami's fine, especially in the ACC. Do you think we'll get a rematch? I mean, that's, that's the real question. Uh, do we get a rematch of the two teams? Yeah, because Notre Dame didn't look good. Um, the only one I worry about would be North Carolina because uh, Miami is, is either the second or third best team in the ACC to me. Uh, and I know Notre Dame fans aren't going to like that, but they looked, I mean, that Florida state team is horrible and we can get to Notre Dame down the line, but they look bad. Um, North Carolina puts up a ton of points. Their defense is still a nightmare, but they're a scary football team when they get that offense going, which they finally did. So I would put Miami number two right now behind Clemson, but UNC and, and Notre Dame right there. All right, so uh, moving on to a different topic. This one was kind of interesting. Uh, all of a sudden, the Falcons are terrible. That's not interesting. But they fire their coach, they fire their GM, and now the city of Atlanta, where I live, everybody's saying, Hank for Trevor, hire Dabo. We heard Dabo and the Texans last week when they fired Bill O'Brien. Do you think Dabo would go pro? I mean, would it, and would it be with one of his two quarterbacks? I don't think he would. But, the, the, you know, he makes a lot of money at Clemson, right? And he's got it really good. The ACC's so far behind him. He could just stay there and win forever. Um, I think an intriguing job for him in college football would be Alabama. Um, but the NFL, I'm not sure. Last year, there was talk about the Carolina Panthers making a run at him before they hired Matt Rule, um, you know, and then tanking for Trevor. You know, the Texans and Deshaun Watson would be very interesting. I, I do think the Falcons – and, you know, they, they could finish last. That team is just awful. The defense is horrible. Um, and the, te- the players don't seem to care much anymore. And they're used to losing. Um, and if they do finish last, they're going to take, you know, uh, Trevor Lawrence, obviously, with the first pick because Matt Ryan, you know, as good a quarterback as he is, he's getting up there. And then maybe Dabo would be tempted. But, um, you know, you got to just – you got to roll with the rumors, man. I mean, Dabo's the new Harbaugh. There's rumors to the NFL every time there's an opening now because he's become that good a coach. So Clemson fans will get upset by this, but they should actually be flattered because everybody wants their coach. Yeah. I, do, take away, like, would he do it? I mean, how do you think he'd be as an NFL coach? I personally think he could do it. I mean, he's he's a good offensive coach. He runs an offense that would fit, I think, in the modern NFL do you think his approach would work? No, <laughs> you say no. <laughs> There's no way. There's just absolutely no way on earth that 
professional NFL millionaire athletes are going to fall into that aw shucks <laughs> mentality. No way. These, you know, we cover these kids in high school. We cover them in college. We see them go off to the NFL. They change immediately once they catch that first big check. And, you know, family is what college is about. And you can sell that. Not going to sell that in the NFL. I think he's a good coach, but the first time they have a losing streak, you know, one of these guys is going to be saying, listen, Uber, enough of your, you know, rah-rah speeches. Let's win some football games. And there's going to be some bad, bad blood there. So I don't think he'd be successful at the NFL level. I think he's perfect where he is. I think he'd be successful at Alabama if he ended up, you know, succeeding um, Nick Saban. But he's a college coach, um, you know, just like Spurrier. That was a disaster, and there's a reason for it. These guys are made for college. All right, moving on. LSU, boy, they're bad, right? I mean, how bad are they? And 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 more importantly, are the are they like a one hit wonder? I mean, is this what do you is this a this, bump of the road? What do you think? The Ed Orgeron is hearing the worst two words that he wants to hear this week, and those two words are Gene Chiswick and. That's what the fear is that, you know, Cam Newton won them a national championship. Gus Malzahn was the key to that. And, and that he's a one hit wonder and, and that now he's going to fall apart and, and Brady or whoever else was propping him up is gone. And, you know, I don't believe that, but man, they look bad. Now I know they're transitioning their defense from a, you know, a, a three, four to four, three, and, and that takes time. And Bellini is a good coach. He's just, he's a little bit of, of a wild guy, but um, they look awful. They're out of the top 25 for the first time, what, since 2017? And everybody's starting to call it, oh, Chizik. I don't agree. I think he did an amazing job last year. I think they lost so much talent that they're just, they just got to rebuild. Um, and Missouri's a good coach. I mean, Drinkwitz is a very good offensive coach. Some of the things they did against LSU is very hard to, to replicate and, and defend against. Uh, I, I I know you're laughing, but I really like what I saw from the offense of Missouri. I don't have anything against Drinkwitz. I just know you're in the tank for him. That's the that's the problem. So, in the tank, I, what's that mean? That just means like like uh, you're a Drinkwitz homer. I don't know what the. Oh, uh, listen. I like the small school coaches that go on to be the underdog in the big conferences, who get a schedule laid out for them that is absolute brutal hell and have a little bit of success i mean that schedule is so unfair to missouri so to see them you know get a victory and they they, they held themselves you know fairly well against alabama i mean they weren't going to win but yeah i'm i'm, I'm pro drink with and i'm pro sam Pittman. That's okay what he's doing in arkansas all right so let's stay on lsu i think one thing that people forget about okay they had a million guys go to the draft we saw the talent that they lost there then they also had the opt-outs okay you had jamar chase you had tyler shelvin i forget if they had anybody else but then you had a a few guys transfer too you had uh marcel brooks uh fulton Fulton opted out out too right yeah i think he transferred to texas tech maybe oh did he you know well somebody transferred to texas tech the the, or he opted out the point the point is they lost a ton of ta- – how much talent did they lose? Everybody. I mean, they, they got a couple offensive linemen left. Uh, Miles Brennan is a, you know, he's a serviceable quarterback, but they lost the number one pick in the draft. They lost the best running back to the draft. Uh, they lost Jamar Chase, who is my number one uh, wide receiver for next year's draft. Um, you know, Patrick Queen is gone. Uh, you name it. I mean – there was a ridiculous year for LSU in the draft and the losses. I, I don't think I've ever seen a team, and this includes Alabama, lose as much talent in one year than LSU did from their national championship. And that's because of the pandemic. It's because of, uh, you know, the, the, the draft and the kids leaving early. Um, but there's talent on that football team. I mean, it's not like they're plugging in two stars. Uh, they just, I just don't think there's that leadership. I don't think there's that that excitement that was that was driven last year by feeling so unbeatable. And and their team leaders are gone, and somebody needs to step up. 
Yeah. So uh, the other thing I want to add in was, of course, they lost Dave Aranda. They lost Joe Brady. And I mean, the combination of a brain drain with a talent drain. And it's, I mean, they, <laughs> if they go 500, I would consider that an accomplishment now. I think, I think you're looking at a four and six type season pers- personally. Well, this was supposed to happen last year. Remember, I, I said Ed Orgeron wasn't a great head coach and they weren't going to do anything. And then they won a national championship. So um, <laughs> now that I, I was against him winning a national championship, I, I, I'm for him turning this around. I really do think they're going to start playing better, but this was a tough loss. I mean, you know, and it certainly doesn't help that the game has moved and all that other stuff, but you know, well, I mean, but Missouri had several guys out too. I mean, the, the issue is you mentioned, Pol- you mentioned Polini. I don't understand. You've got Corey Raymond on the staff who's been there for how many years and put how many guys in the NFL? Why don't you let him be the defensive coordinator? Why, why are you hiring Bo Polini, who's like a, a joke essentially on the national stage? I mean, you know, I don't know the guy and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't old enough whenever he was a head coach somewhere relevant, but I mean, what's the deal with Corey Raymond? Why, why don't, I don't get it, man. Why isn't he, why isn't he coaching? Why isn't he a defensive coordinator? don't know i know relationships run deep in the coaching circles but what's happening now in a lot of places is that the younger guys are getting promoted quicker to coordinator positions than ever and so that would be a natural fit rather than go get a guy who you know is known for his off field and antics and temper and you know all the things that can be distracting to a program who you know, had some success at Nebraska, but was still run out of town, even though he won eight or nine games every year. I have no idea. I, you know, again, I know it's about relationships and comfort, but I also don't know why you change scheme with a new defensive coordinator coming off all those losses either. I mean, not only are you losing Aranda and Brady and 18 billion great players, but now you're asking the defense to learn a completely new scheme. It really is a recipe for disaster. I did not see this coming, though. I thought LSU would, you know, be the second best team in the SEC uh, West, but they are far from it. All right, uh, moving on to some more average teams: uh, Texas and Oklahoma. The <laughs> the Red River Showdown, whatever it's called. Showdown. I mean, it was a cool game. It was fun to watch. I actually went to take a nap, and I was like, "Let me let me sneak a nap in at the end of this game," and I got sucked in, and blah blah yeah. blah. Um, but I mean, the game was brutal. Both of those teams are are you know not elite teams. I think we could say that. We kind of talked about it last week. What, what was your takeaway from the game and and how it might impact things, uh, you know, in the recruiting landscape too? You know, the thing that surprised me was that Texas did fight back. I thought they would sort of give up. Um, you know, they fought back against Texas Tech. TCU beat them. I thought if they fell behind in this one, that they would just sort of like shrug their shoulders and say, oh, well, you know, this isn't our year and Tom Herman's not our coach. And uh, They fought back. They showed a lot of pride. Sam Ellinger is a very fun football player to watch. Um, neither of these teams know how to play great defense. Um, they don't know how to stop the pass uh, at all, which is odd because they live in a passing league. Um, and you know, it was, it was not a great game for the first time. I think you're seeing two Texas and Oklahoma teams playing in the red river showdown who have a 0% chance of winning the big 12. Um, Oklahoma's two and two and one and two in conference. Now, Texas one and two in conference now as well. And, you know, when, when have both teams been eliminated by the time the red river showdown comes around, it's never going to happen before. So it's kind of depressing, but you're Oklahoma, if everything's going to be all right, they are on a I mean, Luther, Luther burden and they're on a red, they're ready for a five-star role like you've never seen before in your life from Oklahoma. And it's so ironic because they're not a good football team. But Texas, you, I mean, Billy Bowman decommitted, you got problems. Well, uh, and guess what? It's okay for Oklahoma to not – go undefeated every year. In my opinion, you're going to have a down year. You got a new quarterback. Uh, you're missing some, some weapons, especially a wide receiver. I think it's okay. Like it's not, it's not playoff or bust every year. You don't make it every single year. So uh, let's talk about the, the Tom Herman situation. Uh, 
you wrote uh, in your in your fact or fiction that he's a goner. We we saw some talk of, oh, what about Urban Meyer, uh, Jeff Ketchum, who covers Texas for us for uh, OrangeBloods.com, wrote last week that no matter what happens, Herman Herman's there through 2021. I mean, you think he makes it? You think he's the coach next season? We don't have to go beyond that, but I mean. Uh, you know, in a shortened season, pandemic year, you'd assume that guys would have job security more so than, than previous years. But this is Texas. Uh, this season is not going to be great. They could go, I mean, they could win five, six games, maybe, uh, based on what I've seen. There's players leaving the team. There's players in the portal. There's players quitting in the fourth quarter. It just doesn't look like it's if they if they give Herman another year, it's it's a Clay Helton decision to me. And I was I love the Herman hire. I thought he was going to be great, and it's turned out to be a disaster. Um, and I think if they do give him another year, they're just wasting their time. Um, but I don't know the inner workings. You know, uh, the Grand Puva Council or whatever has to get together and figure out if they want to pay the buyout and all that stuff. I don't know that side of the world I just know wins and losses and, and effort and teams you know and, and they did seem to want to play for him at the end of that game but it really doesn't matter um, Urban Meyer would be very interesting I'm not going to say never say never because I, I laughed when they said Ohio State and Urban Meyer at first it's a huge program they'll throw a ton of money at him he can recruit Texas I mean he recruited Texas better at Ohio State than Texas recruited Texas um, and he could win the Big 12 I think easily um, because he's, you know, that's the, 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 the path, the least resistance, I would say to, to the playoff. Um, it just depends, you know, on if you wanted to come out after him though, there's a huge drop off as far as who you could hire. I wouldn't even know where to start to look. Yeah. Bill O'Brien's available. Uh. <laughs> Bill O'Brien, local guy. I mean, uh, obviously local now from, from the Texans, but you know, the Nick Saban rumors will start and all the other ridiculous Texas coaching rumors that start. Um, but, I mean, James Franklin will be mentioned. It, all the same names we mentioned. I just don't know who wants to go in there and take that job now. Um, it's a great job. But if you're looking for a coach to make a lateral move, it's not one they're going to jump at. So you got to try to find someone who's moving up in the world and, and get the right fit. All right, so we'll see what happens with, with Herman. I think the one thing that complicates Herman and Urban Meyer are close, right? I mean, yes. So do we think Urban would take the job after they fired Herman? I don't know. Urban don't he doesn't care. <laughs> He's a shark. <laughs> Urban doesn't care. He's out for Urban. Uh, the feelings? What are feelings? No, feelings. No, he would take the Texas job. He would. All right, so another uh, shootout game that, that was really enjoyable. Ole Miss and uh, Alabama. <laughs> we saw a stat floating around the, the internet that uh, that Alabama got, like, all the possible yardage they could have had except, like, 20 yards. Did you see that stat? Yeah, and, and I also see that Saban's thinking that, um, that Kiffin had his defensive – play calls and all this stuff. I mean, come on, your defense stunk. You looked awful. Your defense coordinator's in over his head. Old Miss is a talented team, but not talented enough to put up 48 on any Alabama team I've, I've seen in the last, you know, 15 years. So that was an embarrassing win. Uh, it was great for Old Miss fans because it was an exciting game, but my goodness, uh, Alabama looked like Oklahoma. They had to outscore Old Miss to win a football game and you really don't say that very often about Alabama. And, you know, I know he's done this before, but <clears throat> Ole Miss on such a roll that they had to start faking injuries to slow him down because the pace was so high. You know, and I know he's done that in the Iron Bowl and stuff, but that's that's pure Nick Saban desperation when that happens. And it was happening against Old Miss and Lane Kiffin, which is not what you'd expect. Who, uh, who, is, who is Alabama's defensive coordinator? <laughs> Do you know? Because I don't know. I that. <laughs> no, I do know. Oh, man. I got it on my Twitter. Um, I'll, look, I'll look it up. Uh, I wanted to talk about Matt Corral, though. You were on. You were in our text thread 
talking about how good he was and or how good he is. I mean, it seems like a pretty good fit with uh, with Lane Kiffin, right? Pete Golding. Pete uh, Golding. Yeah, where did he come from? I mean, forget it. I never heard of the guy. Was he with the Patriots? Oh, maybe he was a Patriots guy. Yeah, I mean, there is that Belichick uh, connection there. No, no, no. TSA, something this. <laughs> wow. Where did he find him? I don't know. From UTSA. <laughs> I don't know. You have to think that, like, you know, I always say that Saban really coaches the defense. And I have yeah. to imagine that it's going to be a hands-on going into this week, right? I'm just looking at his resume, and I'm wondering how that's good. It must have been laminated. You know how you <laughs> laminate your resume to make it stick out? I'm just looking at his pictures. He looks like a bro that I'd see at a, a, at a party or something. So he, he um, played at Delta State, and then he went to coach at Tusculum College, if I'm pronouncing that right. Then back to his alma mater, Delta State, from there to Southern Louisiana, from there to Southern Miss, and then um, at UTSA. Yeah, that's not exactly the, uh, the uh, pedigree that you'd expect, given the, you know, Kirby Smarts and Jeremy Pruitts and whoever else you want to say. He was hired as a defensive assistant and then was named the coordinator, so... It's embarrassing, though. I should have popped that name up right in my head, but I didn't realize it. Was really well, I didn't know it either. That's why I asked this you. It's kind of like my resume. So so here's the question for you on Alabama. Saban's never lost any of his assistants, ever, from what right. I understand. Kirby going to be the first? Well, I guess we can jump into that. Sorry, Matt Corral, you <laughs> You don't get any time. No, we can talk Matt Corral. He looked really good. Like, Matt Corral had some issues in high school, okay? Off-field issues I'm not going to talk about because they're just off-field issues. USC dropped him. Florida dropped him. Ole Miss took him. He looks like a five-star. He was so impressive in that game. Um, I don't know, man. That, that's a good-looking quarterback right there. That's the kid we saw before all the problems. So I think getting away from home was good for him. And I think he's a terrific fit for Kiffin. Man, he, he had a good game. And he stuck it out. I mean, other people might have left, especially with the Plumley. You know, it seemed like Plumley was going to be the guy, I mean, based on the way last year ended. And if, if they didn't change coaches, obviously he probably would have been. I thought Plumley was definitely going to be the guy. And, uh, you know, listen to Matt Carell's I, – I, I wrote some things about Matt Carell's abilities – that were not pleasant um, when he came to our camp in Indianapolis and looked awful at the five-star challenge. Um, but we ended up dropping him from five to four stars. I think the whole family hates my guts, but man, he looked good. So he likes I, me. I'm sorry, Matt Corral. Matt Corral always liked me and he still does. He t- I talked to him on Instagram all the time. You don't like, you don't like me. He didn't <laughs> block me though. Block me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should. We'll, we'll then we'll save that for a slower time. We can go over who's blocked you on Twitter. Uh, all right, let's jump in. Do you want to do the Georgia Alabama preview? We can do it. Uh, Georgia smoked Tennessee. I don't think we need to talk about the game. I mean, it was close at half. Uh, Tennessee was winning at halftime, but yeah. guess what? So was Arkansas a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I mean, Georgia blew them out in the second half. Uh, they look really their defense looks awesome looks very fast it's definitely in my opinion the best defense in the country yeah but can they slow down Alabama like you said can Kirby break the streak can he be the first one to beat Saban what do you think um you know my wife and I do this every Saturday we pick the games and she doesn't know anything about college football <laughs> um she has to ask sometimes when I say Florida or Florida State she has to do is it the chomp or the, you know, so she doesn't know. But every time I ask her, Alabama versus, it doesn't matter. It could be the New England Patriots or, you know, she says Bama. So I'm going to say Bama because you know what? She's right 99% of the time. So I still think Bama offense, but it's just so many weapons. Najee Harris, thank goodness for you, Najee, man. I mean, we made you number one in the country. You waited it out. You could have jumped to the NFL, been a third round pick, made us look average, but now you're making us look super smart. So those two wide receivers, the depth, Mac Jones on point, 
I just don't think the Georgia defense is great, but I, I just don't think there's any way to slow down that Alabama offense. So I'll be curious to see how Alabama's offensive line holds up. I felt like – I didn't feel like they they played very well the other night. And I think if if Georgia can get to Mac and, and hit him early in the game, I think that bodes well for them. I also think Alabama's – you know, Najee had that huge game. But they struggled in the other games running between the tackles. So uh, those are the two things I'm looking at. I, I do think – now, I – I think the Ole Miss deserves more credit for how good their offense is, the kind of offense they're running. Uh, of course, their offensive coordinator was at UCF last year, Mike, or your, your favorite school. <laughs> that, that's, that's the offense that they run. They basically run the UCF offense. Yep. Uh, Come on, Kiffin's and, running that offense. Absolutely 110% Kiffin's running that offense. So, but I, what, I'm say, so what I'm saying, though, is Georgia is three weeks into a new offense, and – there was a time, I think early in the third quarter, where I was like, you know, maybe the maybe the Stetson Bennett uh, honeymoon is over here. Uh, but he obviously played well down the stretch, and they blew it open. Do you think with the athletes Alabama has, they could cause a few more problems, even though they played bad against Ole Miss? Do you think they can cause problems for Bennett and, and Georgia, especially, I mean, Georgia, they couldn't run the ball against Tennessee at all. I mean, they have – Alabama's defense is suspect for sure. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Um, I think it really comes down to Georgia's defense versus Alabama's offense, and the others will sort of wash. I think Georgia will put up points. I think Alabama will get some stops. But can Georgia's defense, which is so good, can it slow down that Alabama offense? That's what it's going to come down to. So we could see, like, for the first time, I don't know, in a while, like a crazy Big 12-like shootout between Alabama and Georgia which would be fun. Um, I know Georgia's not that explosive on offense, but Alabama looks that weak on defense when it comes to just missed assignments. But I will tell you this, the offensive line for Alabama is loaded across the board with talent. They looked awful. They made a lot of dumb mistakes. Najee Harris was in their ear. I mean, he had a great game and he was just yelling at him. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. They will be ready. Nick Saban's going to take this week he will not be socially distancing from his offensive line at all. <laughs> he will be as close as humanly possible to their faces and telling them that they need to step it up. And I think they'll do that and, and win the game. It should be a very good game, though. All right, let's move on. Next topic. Uh, you mentioned Dan Mullen. He said he wants fans in the stands waving their hands. Uh yeah, you've been very outspoken about what you think about <laughs> playing football. So what do you think, Mike? Do you think there should be a, a full house at the swamp or what? I don't think it should be brought up. Like, first of all, I think it's irresponsible to put 88,000 people into a stadium during a pandemic. Okay. Now I want football. I've always wanted football. I've never said that there's not something happening, but to come out and say 88,000 should just be stuffed into the stands next to each other, drinking and drooling on each other. That's just not really smart. So I don't think that, but I don't think it should have been brought up. You lost. You lost not because of the fan noise and the crowd noise and all that other stuff. I mean, you, you've won at Kyle Field before with a full house. This is not a great Texas a and team at all. Kellen Mond is a beyond average quarterback. Unfortunately for me, because I made him a five star, and you made him look great. Uh, Isaiah Spiller ran for 174 yards. Your defense is horrible. The Gators' defense is awful, and there's a real problem there. So fans are not. If they can't stop people, their offense is so fun to watch. But they're 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 in trouble. If you're losing and giving up 41 to Kellen Mond and Texas A&M, I don't care where you are. So don't even bring up the crowd. Just say, listen, we stunk on defense. we got to fix it. Grantham is going to be talked to, blah, blah, blah. They owned us, and that's it. But now he looks like he's whining, you know, because, oh, they have fans. fans. Come on. That should have been a, a, a Florida two-touchdown victory if they had any semblance of defense. Yeah, their defense is, is uh, not good. So, all right, let's move on. Uh, let's do Farrell's Heisman watch. Boy, it's it's last week. I think you defaulted to Trevor as number one. 
So who is uh, who's number one this week? Oh, good gosh, it's uh, Trevor Lawrence, of course. Has no to going to stop Trevor Lawrence from winning it this year. He's going to be given the the Heisman Trophy no matter what. Um, the others are all battling for second place. So you've got Travis Etienne on his own team who's going to maybe take some votes away from him, but I don't think they will because the running back's not going to win it this year. But he's in my top five, probably fifth. Uh, Najee Harris has to be up there as well. But again, a running back's not going to win it this year. So that who does that leave you? Ellinger on a two and two team? No, Ellinger, no, I don't want to hear anything about him. Mac Jones is above him. So you got Mac Jones because Trask is gone now, right? They lost. He's, he's, I mean, maybe, yeah. But eh, maybe not, but still, he's falling behind. Mac Jones is probably your number two because he's a quarterback of, you know, Alabama. Justin Fields, once he plays, will leapfrog him in the number two. It'll come down to Trevor and Justin Fields uh, with Mac. And I don't know who else. I mean, you know. Kyle Pitts. <laughs> he's not going to keep doing what he's doing. It's impossible. Uh, he's great but he can't score multiple touchdowns every game. Uh, wide receivers don't want it. Tight end ain't going to win it. So um, <laughs> then you look at, I don't know, like Sam Howell, my favorite. Okay. <laughs> North, Carolina. North Carolina is not very good. I hate to break it. Three and oh, baby. They're number five. If they're the number five team in the country, please. Line them up He's again. The starting quarterback on the number five team in the country. He's got to be considered in the Heisman talk. Yeah, I, I can't. I mean, believe. if Ian Book is listed, Sam Howell's got to be listed. If Kellen Mond's listed, <laughs> Sam Howell. Sam Howell doesn't even follow me on Twitter anymore. He used to. Nobody pumps him up more than me. Nobody. I think, I believe me, I'm aware. You're. And it's extremely of... rude that he doesn't follow me back. What I do is I keep unfollowing him and then following him so he gets a notification that I followed him. And it's like Sam, and he still won't follow me. I'm gonna Whatever. check. If, I'm gonna check if he follows me. All right. I, Trevor follows me. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. <laughs> I wished him a happy birthday the other day. Got no response. Well, Trevor follows me, but he changed his phone number. We used to communicate via text, but he got too famous for. Uh... Oh, he's gonna unfollow us so fast. <laughs> he just doesn't realize he follows us. Like that's the key. Like Saquon Barkley follows me. He doesn't know. So I just got to keep quiet yeah. <laughs> and keep that as one of my clout followers. <laughs> All right. Uh, forgotten five star of the week. Oh, God. Bring it. How, how does a little name I like to call Ray Ray McLeod sound? Ray Ray McLeod. That's our old boss, Eric Winter's favorite football player ever. Yes. Um, five star out of Tampa. Had an okay career at Clemson. I believe he was drafted by the Carolina Panthers. Uh, I think the Bills drafted him, maybe. Okay. Let me look. I, is, he, is he playing? I didn't know he was. Yeah, he played. Yeah, he, oh, he had a big game yesterday. You don't know what team You don't know what team he's on, though, huh? If I had to guess, no. I have no idea what team he's on, no. Oh, the Pittsburgh Steelers. How did he have a big game when Claypool caught four touchdowns? Oh, Ray, Ray McLeod making play after play for Steelers from the, uh, tri- what is this, Trib Live, whatever newspaper that is. Yeah, no, I, I love the Tribune, but let me see what Ray Ray's stats were. Ray Ray McLeod had the fifth longest rush of the season, 58 yards. Yeah. And he has the third longest kick return, 49 yards. So he had a 58-yard carry yesterday that got him down uh, – Right by the goal line, he almost scored. Uh, every time he touches the ball, he makes a play. Clay, Clay, uh, Chase Claypool said. So, how do you like Ray that? Ray. You love Ray Ray, but come on. What? Ray, Ray has. Listen, I'm not. I'm not trying to be a hater here. Three catches for 12 yards this year. Well, yeah, but the 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 rush. You're not counting the rush. Uh, he's got. He had two carries for 63 yards yesterday. Look at How many did Saquon Barkley have? I forgot. Oh, wow. <laughs> you went there? 
How it's many? Not reflecting his tremendous rushing stats here. But uh, you have Ray to... Ray's a good player, but yeah, come on. Well, right, but this is the forgotten five, so you didn't know he was in the league, so I got you. You did. Well, I, I will tell you this. I'll admit I knew he was in the league. I just forgot where. And the only reason I know he's in the league is because every once in a while I get a text message from this guy out in Vegas named Hunter. who's like, Ray Ray. Ray Ray's still doing it. You know? So I knew he was in the league, but what was he, a fifth round pick? Something like that. He was, I think he was a seventh rounder. I know his hair is awesome. He was like, he you didn't can't... have that hair in high school. Okay, so before he got hurt, Saquon Barkley had 19 carries for 30, 40 yards this year. So Ray Ray's doubled that in just two carries. So Ray Ray has two carries for 63 yards, 31 and a half. He hasn't put a touchdown point though. And he's worth a total of 9.5 fantasy points. <laughs> what yeah, about not Ray Ray, but I'm saying, I just didn't know he was in the league. Why don't you get fantasy points for kick returns? That's an excellent question. Well, he got, he has two fantasy points for other than, yeah, no, he's got fantasy points for receptions and, and for rushes and that's it. He didn't get anything for their returns. Yeah. That's a, I think that has to be like built into your defense or something. And like these gimmick uh, leagues, we'd have to, uh, we'd have to ask somebody else about someone on the, the fantasy team. Well, I've, anyway. actually, I've officially retired from fantasy football because it's something that happened this week. Um, Le'Veon Bell came off the injured reserve. Like he was, you have an IR league slot and he came off and I didn't move him quick enough. And then Michael Thomas was ruled ineligible for the game because of disciplinary reasons. And so I tried every combination of moving everybody around and picking up a wide receiver and I couldn't do it. Um, I still can't. And I wanted John Brown or somebody who's playing, you know, Monday or Tuesday night. Couldn't do it. So I'm going to lose. So I, I'm officially retiring. I told everybody my, I, my team name is uh, named after the tremendous Chinese trampolinist Dong Dong. Do you remember him? No, I don't. That's my team name. And, and I'm doing a retirement sort of farewell tour starting this week for fantasy football because I can't stand it anymore. I'm done. So. Well, so you're still going to update your lineup? I haven't decided whether I'm going to ruin it for everybody else because that's a real jerk move. That's a yeah. complete jerk move. Um, but I might, I might, I might just tank. <laughs> oh, I'd be so mad. No, I won't. Because that's really that's like one of the worst things you could possibly do. You know, like yeah. killing somebody is to purposely tank in your fantasy league. That's just awful. I won't do that. So yeah, that happened to me earlier this uh, this year in the season where. The woman who played me, she had a baby uh, the week or the week before when she was playing the number one team in the league, didn't update her lineup and lost, had the baby, then fixed her lineup and destroyed me the next week. So, I mean, you know. She probably had the baby pick too. Well, here's the thing. Look, if you're going to have a baby, set your lineup before you go into labor. <laughs> okay. Or update it while you're in labor, right? Hey, I tweeted Kelly Bryant's transfer news, you know, from the delivery room. So uh, I don't want to hear any excuses. It's, it's possible to get it. <laughs> I hear you. I, listen, no mercy. You want to play fantasy football, you got to you gotta fight through everything. So, but she probably did let the baby pick and kick your butt. All right, let's move on. We're going to wrap up. Uh, I got to go to the bathroom. So we're going to be a sprint to the finish here a little bit. Um, Dwayne Haskins, let's talk about him. Speaking of people who blocked you on Twitter, former Rivals 100 really was a Rivals camp discovery, if I remember yeah. correctly. He had no offers, won MVP, blew up, then got mad about his ranking, hated you, hated everyone, uh, and blocked you on Twitter. Goes yep. to the NFL, yep. first round pick. Unblocked me for a day. And then block me again. Did he tweet at you during that time? No. Nope. Okay, so he gets benched, and then he didn't show up yesterday, right? He he wasn't there. Uh, he was he was sick. Oh, is that what the excuse ended up being? Mm -hmm. Do you buy it? Mm -hmm. No, he's trade bait. He's gone. He's gone. Uh, you know, you want to win with your own players, and unfortunately for him, he he's going to be the Josh Rosen of that draft, where he's going to be tossed aside. For another quarterback 
I mean, Kyle Allen, a former five star, uh, got the nod as a starter. Alex Smith, who has one leg left, is number two on the depth chart. And he's an amazing story. But, you know, to demote him to third, it tells Dwayne Haskins, you're out of here. You're gone. We're trading you. It's not a fit. And it's too early to do that, honestly. He's, he hasn't been bad. But I saw his stats compared to Josh Allen's first whatever number of games, and they were much better. So, I mean, yeah. who's going to trade for him? What are you going to give for him? Uh, not much. Um, you know, someone will probably take a flyer on him for a third rounder or a fourth rounder or something like that. That's about it. But Rivera doesn't play. You know, he, he doesn't play. Um, and I don't know what is behind the scenes on any of this stuff. I just know, you know, the experience that we had – uh, covering him in high school, if, if that experience was any similar to the experience that the coach has had at the NFL level, then uh, eesh. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, take Haskins out of the equation. So many of these NFL teams draft a quarterback and then fire the coach after the first year. I don't know why. Look, it, if, you're, if you're drafting a quarterback, you got to say, okay, this is the coach that we're going to have for three or four years. Because how many quarterbacks have been ruined? You mentioned Rosen. They ha- they draft Rosen. They fire the coach after the year. Rosen's career is ruined. They draft Haskins. I feel like Mariota had three coaches in four years before he got shown the door or whatever. It's just like so many of them, they do this. If you are going to draft a quarterback, make sure you have your coach in place. It's not that hard. Don't go, you know, Todd Bowles or whoever and give them – one half of a year and then fire them when they're playing a rookie quarterback. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And it's just like, you know, new coaches are like consultants to businesses. A consultant comes into your business, right? And they can't say everything is great because they're getting paid to pick apart the current right. business. So they're going to make stuff up, you know, or your company may really be very screwed up. Either way, they're going to want to go with their own people. You know, they're going to want to go with their own players. They're going to want to go with guys that, you know, step in line with uh, how they approach the game. Kyle Allen is a Rivera guy. Uh, Alex Smith has always been a guy that everybody raves about off the field. Um, It's unfair to Haskins, even though he did block me. I don't hold that grudge. Um, He's too, too early for his career to be thrown away. And, and same with Rosen. Now, these guys will eventually surface. You know, Rosen will surface eventually at Tampa Bay and get an opportunity uh, or at another pro- another football team. And Haskins will, too. But it's a start that you can't recover from. What, name the last quarterback who was benched as a rookie and then traded who had success. I can't think of any of them. Right. No, it's, a, it's not a good situation. Uh, all right, let's move on. You mentioned Billy Bowman earlier. We'll talk about him here. He was committed to Texas, has been for a while. Versatile athlete. Texas won him at DB. He might want to play receiver. His girlfriend goes to Oklahoma, and all of a sudden he decommits out of the blue. I don't think anyone was expecting it, and now we think he's going to be another weapon for Oklahoma. He's going to end up committing there? Yeah, there's a little doubt about it. There was, there was talk of this for a while because his girlfriend does play softball at Oklahoma. And, you know, Bowman's a very soft-spoken kid, doesn't really answer a lot of questions and doesn't talk um, about recruiting that much. But there was some worry amongst the Texas fan base that Bowman would decommit. Um, You know, everything needed to go perfectly this season or or really well. So she was one of the people who, I forget what emoji she used when he decommitted, but it was a happy one. Uh, so this is done. I mean, it's over. He's going to, unless they get in a big fight <laughs> before signing day, uh, he's going to Oklahoma. And like I said, Oklahoma is ready to just have an amazing run in recruiting, uh, which is, you know, kind of ironic because they are struggling so bad. But but him and Jennings, Braden Jennings, uh, uh, Brandon Jennings, decommitting for Florida State, that's a killer. These are like a knife – between the ribs, these are the ones that really hurt. I'm, I'm doing my three-point stance. I'm doing the top 10 decommitments in 2021 because I'm ingenious like that. And uh, they're right up near the top. These hurt. Oh, do they, would you say they sting? I mean, would that be a <laughs> used for an article? They might commitments? sting. 
Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> oh, you're trying to claim that you invented that? <laughs> I definitely invented writing it monthly. Somebody... 2006, circa uh -huh. 2006, we had something called the Feral Files. Uh, where we talked about deep commitments. And then prior to the future cast, we had the feral forecast. It's just all been taken away from me. Okay. So. All right. Nobody <laughs> cares. Nobody <laughs> cares. Believe me. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I guess we, 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 we're going to do the fan base kind of beef of the week with the fan base that's angriest with you. Yeah. Last week it was UCF. Had a pretty good reaction on Twitter. I got some shrapnel from that. People be like, oh, I've never heard of Woody. Of course you've never heard of me. That's what they want. They don't want you to hear from me. That's why I've been muzzled by my own alma mater. Oh, but th but this, this week, it uh, seems to be the all the Florida schools, and particularly Miami, was angry with you after uh, you took a, a shot saying maybe all the schools from Florida are bad. Is that what you tweeted? Yeah. I said maybe all the schools in Florida suck. Um, short of IMG and uh, some high schools. Um, yeah, I mean, Florida, you know, I got some Florida fans saying we lost on the road to a top 25 football team. Listen, Texas Tech, I mean, Texas A&M is not a top 25 football team. They're just there because there's nobody else playing right now. Uh, they're, they're not a great football team. And Miami fans were upset because they thought they were really going to beat Clemson, which was never going to happen. And Florida State's just horrendously awful. And they hung in with Notre Dame. Now, it could be Notre Dame next week because I'm writing about how they have zero chance to play off the way that offense looks and, and the defensive lapses they have there. But to the, to the state of Florida fans, I don't hate the Gators, the Canes, or the Knolls. I don't like them either. I don't care. But, man, for those three programs to all – get throttled uh and again i know florida didn't get throttled but it was embarrassing the same week that's just bad that's it's just bad so i believe uh we're trying to find the this the stats here just to confirm i believe the only undefeated head coach in the state of florida can you guess who it is college football this would be a great tweet by the way if you tweeted this you'd get a lot of love Does it rhyme with Butch Favis? No, it's Willie Taggart, 1-0 and at FAU. I am going to tweet that. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I, just, I think, <laughs> listen, Florida State fans should probably start campaigning, bring Taggart back, right? <laughs> yeah, he's 1-0. Left you without a quarterback for two years. I think FA, FIU is 0-2. UCF lost, of course, to Tulsa. USF has lost, and then uh, – Wow. The Gators, Miami, and Florida State have all lost. So. Wow. Willie Taggart gets the laugh, laugh, last laugh, and and also twenty, what, twenty two million dollars? Yeah, I hope I hope it's a lot. Uh, you know, <laughs> Willie once was supposed to appear on this very podcast, and he made me wait outside his office for two hours, and then completely blew me off. So <laughs> big shout, <laughs> big shout to Willie uh, on that one. All right, now I wanted to talk to you about this before we wrap up. You took to Twitter last night following the Lakers championship victory, noted NBA fan, Mike Farrell. How many games did you watch of the finals? None. Okay. I didn't watch one second of okay. the finals. So Mike tweets, LeBron is great, but the only title he won without a super team he helped organize was in Cleveland. Jordan did it all with what he had. Now, how would you describe the response to that tweet, Mike? Oh, it went pretty, uh, pretty bad. It went pretty poorly. See, I'm an old. I'm an old. Right. The young feel LeBron is the best. Prior to me, the young felt, because Magic Johnson's kind of in the, the Michael Jordan era. So right. there was Kobe is better than Jordan. Then there's LeBron's better than Jordan. Prior to me, there was nobody. There what really about Kareem? Nobody. Bill yeah, Russell. Yeah, but... He was a specialized, you know, skyhook, seven foot three dude, like Will Chamberlain, maybe, you know, but the talk of the goat started with Jordan to me. And I just think he had some great players with him, of course, but LeBron had to leave Cleveland to put it together, his little team in Miami. 
where they won what? Two titles? Yeah, they won two. Embarrassingly. They lost to Dallas with one good player, right? Yeah, they lost to Dirk. Then he went back to Cleveland, and that was impressive because Kyrie was drafted there. He didn't he didn't maneuver Kyrie there. He did get Kevin Love over to the to the Cavaliers, but LeBron carried that that team against a super team against Golden State. So that's his that's his one, right? The Lakers. I mean, come on. You got how are they, top five here, players. Here's the two issue. Two of the top five players in the NBA. Right, but how is that a super team? It's a super team. Two out of five, that's 40% of your team. Well, right, but you, I think a super team is defined as like the Celtics when they got KG, Pierce, and Ray Allen. The Heat when they got – when they went and got the guys. They went and got Bosh, and they went and got LeBron. Now right. – and they th- those guys came as, as free agents – or in, in big trades. I mean, is it a super team just because it's him and Anthony Davis? They traded like five first round picks for the guy. Uh, Anthony Davis is a top five player in the NBA, correct? Yeah. Who's who's the LeBron third? James is a top five player in the NBA, correct? Yeah, correct. It's two out of five. Now, <laughs> Michael Jordan was the number one player in the NBA at the time. Right. Scotty Pippen was not a top five player. I don't know about that. I mean, depending on who on, you, you got, ask, he's top fifty got Bird, all the time, Mike. You got, Magic, you got Bird, you got Magic, you got uh, Isaiah Thomas. Okay, Bird Carl was. <laughs> okay, Bird and Magic were out of the picture for the second three titles. Carl Owen sucks. Iverson, Barkley. Oh. I mean, come on, <laughs> these are great names. Scotty Listen. Pippen's a great player, but Jordan didn't go out and say, "Wow, I can't win without Scotty. Let's let's go to his team." Jordan stayed in Chicago. And he, he left to play baseball like an idiot. And then came back and said, I, I'm just going to win some more. So I like LeBron, but this manufacturing your teams. And who did they get through in the West? I mean, come on. Look at these teams. There's not a good team there. <laughs> you look did them, a match. You have no idea what's going on. This is like- No, I don't know anything about basketball, but I know this. Ready? All these teams in the West suck. Everyone I'm looking at. The Nuggets, really? Who's their best player? Could you name, can you name him? Yeah, he's a foreign guy. <laughs> he's tall. It begins with a D. This is like, this is like, no, it does not begin with a D. It's Nikola Jokic. And, okay. num- and number two, this is just like when Rob came on here before the last dance started. I know you didn't hear it, but Rob came on the podcast and said Jordan wouldn't be a top five player and the modern NBA. That's what he said. And he got <laughs> killed by the last dance yet either. I should. He got I, killed by me and Lackford. And if Lackford were on here, we'd be roasting you uh, right now. I look, I'm a Jordan guy, but I also root for LeBron. I was rooting for LeBron to win. So congratulations. But I, I, I like just want to run. I think he's a great ambassador. I really do like him. Seems to be a nice person. <laughs> okay. But he's not Michael Jordan. Okay. All right. Yeah. He's a, he's a nice person. Unlike Jordan. <laughs> not a nice person but he got a lot of rings all lot right rings. before we wrap up anything else you want to talk about complain about yeah stuff? no i want to do my collectible oh, of the week. mike wants to show off his toys so what do we got all right ready this, this is Nicole after movie? i threw shade at the miami fans this right here is an authentic baltimore ravens helmet with signatures from Ed Reed and Ray Lewis. I want you all to marvel at this beautiful, beautiful collectible. A couple of two stars got signed the helmet for you, huh? And notice surrounding them, Ray Lewis (laughs) with the Hurricanes and Ray Lewis with the Ravens. So take that, Miami fans. You think I, I hate your team? I don't. You just got drilled by Clemson. It's not my fault. And I love my toys like a five-year-old. Well, that was that was riveting content, especially for the audio listeners. Uh, to, to see oh, people listen to this on audio? They don't watch us? Yeah, to see Mike's uh, helmet. That he, that did, let me ask you a question. When you acquire these things, are you holding the helmet and being like, hey, Ray, can you sign this for me? Or are you going somewhere and buying it? No, I buy it with the signatures and verified 
verification. No. I, I, my buddy, my buddy goes and gets the signatures because he wants to to meet these players for two minutes. So he spent like three hundred and fifty dollars on Emmett Smith's autograph, and I watched it, and it was hilarious because Emmett Smith wanted no part of any human being he was signing for and sloughed him off as fast as possible. And I said, was that worth it? Why don't you just buy a Florida helmet with Emmett? Well, I got to meet Emmett. Yeah. You don't want to meet your, your idols. You do not. I've well, met a few of mine. No boy. No. I met Emmett Smith at the rivals camp. He came and hung out and he was plenty nice. I'm sure he was. I never met him. Never I'll tell met you him. also, I'll tell you also I've met Ed Reed and Ray Lewis and I would met them. I would not say they're as nice as uh, Emmett was. So they are awesome. <laughs> they are amazing. They're gods. If you want to hear a speech yeah. about throwing your cup in the trash, uh, I know where to go. I got to sell a seminar to Ray Lewis and Ed Reed talking about how nobody wanted to recruit them and they were basically walk-ons playing for the that great. Is right there, there, my favorite part of this podcast. Right there. What? Because I got a billion of them all over the place. Nobody, okay, please give us feedback to know if you want to see more of Mike's action figures. Well, they're gonna see more of it, whether they would like it or not. I mean, I spent a lot of money on this garbage. I, I can't. I, you know how much that is? I please I sell that for 750 bucks easy. No problem. Who's buying it? Oh, there's a whole bevy of people out there who are just as big a loser as me. <laughs> The yeah, thing is, you big. meet the people in real life. That's why I don't know how you can still have any reverence for them at all after. I pretend that I never met them. I pretend. Oh, okay. Like, I never met Craig James. Never. What do I have back here? I'll tell you what I have. Look at this. How about some Tillamook cheese? Have you ever had, <laughs> have you ever had Tillamook cheese? No. Baby uh, loaf? Oh, yeah. This is a mock uh, two-pound loaf. Of Tillamook cheese, world's best medium cheddar. I would uh, get your hands on that, Mike, if you like cheddar cheese. That uh, might stop me up. I'm a little old. That's the kind of memorabilia I have in my house. So, uh, all right. I don't. I don't think I have. I had something to complain about, but I can't remember it now. So, uh, my main complaint is people that buy sports memorabilia. I think. <laughs> Got my USFL magnets. Huh? <laughs> You're such I'm a, a complete loser. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Such a nerd. Do you have any arcade games in your house, like full size arcade? No, no, but I thought about it. I thought about getting like um, my, Space my, Invaders and stuff. My brother in law's got several, uh, he'll give me some advice on. So, uh, Galaga and whatnot, you know, those. Does he types. do like uh, Dungeons and Dragons cosplay? Because I'm not that much of a. No, but he's got a bunch of sports memorabilia. He's got like a, a base from when the Red Sox won the World Series and stuff like ah, that. I like your brother better than you by far. He seems cool. <laughs> All right, that wraps it up. We want to remind everybody, subscribe to the Rivals YouTube channel. Uh, what, is the, what is the address? <laughs> YouTube.com slash Rivals Features. What is the address? So, well, I've been trying to get a change to just Rivals. I'm working on that in my spare time. Uh, leave a review on iTunes, either on the Godfather and Gorney feed or the Commitment Issues feed where you're listening to me here. I believe... I'm going to have an NFL uh, draft expert on uh, later in the week, Mike. So Who, me? No, not you. Uh, an outside expert. So we'll see. But it, he, he also has ties to the Bachelorette franchise. He was a contestant on the Bachelorette. So uh, the Bachelorette debuts tomorrow night, Tuesday night. So Did he play at Florida? No. He was a, he's a nerd, football analyst, who was on the Bachelorette. So... Uh, I'm trying to get that worked out with my schedule because I'm on the road. So uh, tune in for the select, you know, we do celebrity interviews later in the week. That's the, that's the, the fit now and commitment issues. So well, this is kind of celebrity right here. Oh yeah. Big Ed Reed and Ray Lewis. Yeah, we <laughs> I still can't believe we did that. I can't. Tell him on for Heisman. All right. That wraps it up. Uh, join Mike later in the week for his podcast with Gorney and me to talk about The Bachelorette. All right, talk to you later, Mike. <laughs>